So good afternoon. We are here to get you out of your food coma. Lunch was delicious. I hope everyone enjoyed the award ceremony. Let's start off today's session with a quick poll show of hands. How many people in the room have seen their job responsibilities grow in the last few years, right? Honestly, I expect to see almost everyone's hands go up. And it's just to prove the point of how important HR has become to every organization. So we have some statistics that prove this from a visor survey. Okay, 79% of respondents report their organization cannot succeed without a strategic CHRO. 78% agree that the company's success is driven by a CHRO who contributes to business performance. And 80% report a data-driven CHRO who takes a strong stance on talent contributes to company success. So how does this make you feel? A little pressure there? <laughs> so when I read this survey, I couldn't believe this. I mean, it's remarkable how the role has grown and changed. And it, there is a lot of pressure because talent is the most important asset to a, an organization. But not to worry, we have five CHROs on stage today who are basically like Jedi Masters. And they say, pressure, no pressure. I got this. So what I'd like to do is uh, just start off quickly, um, have everyone on the panel introduce themselves and say their favorite part of their jobs. So I'll go first. I'm Debbie Bola. I'm editorial director of HRO Today magazine. And my favorite part of my job is being able to piece something together from start to finish and deliver a magazine. Candace. Hello, good afternoon. Candace Osinchade, SVP, Chief Administrative Officer, National Aquarium. And the most exciting aspect of my job is helping people reach their potential. And that's truly about growth, whether it's individuals or within the organization. Hi, I'm Carrie Hurt, and I'm the Chief People Officer for MSC Industrial Direct, an, an industrial supply company that's um, nationwide. And um, my most favorite part of my job, um, actually I've only been at MSC for two years now, going on two years, and I think one of the things I like about being a CHRO is that you can be in different industries. And the thing that I like best is understanding the business and then figuring out how the people aspect really can help a business to grow. Hello, I'm Laurie Dalton. I'm Chief HR Officer of Gate Group North America. We're a global airline catering company. Uh, there are lots of aspects that I uh, love about my job. Um, my personality is I like to be right in the middle of everything, uh, and this job allows me to do that. Uh, all of our business challenges involve people. We are a very labor-intensive um, industry. Uh, so I like being able to piece the solutions together, as you were alluding to, and um, connect the dots for our leaders. And uh, also like the fact that no day uh, is like the day before. <laughs> you know, every, every day brings new challenges and new surprises, so I really enjoy that. Hi, I'm Mark Gast. I lead uh, HR for Vail Resorts. Vail owns 11 ski mountains around the world, and all the complementary activities around those mountains, including retail and transportation and hospitality. Um, favorite part of my job, good HR people spend time with their workforce, right? So 40 to 60 days of skiing a year isn't a bad, <laughs> isn't a bad perk. <laughs> but seriously, well, no, that is serious, but it's selfish. Uh, seriously, uh, you know, the, the, what gets me out of bed every morning, the reason I'm in HR is the difference we have to make in the lives of so many, be it the individual interactions, helping teams be more effective, the ripple effect of helping leaders show up in a different way, the ability to build sustainable organizations that do well, do good. I mean, we really have the opportunity to make a lasting and positive impact on our world, and that's why I do what I do. So that's my favorite part of my job. Uh, my name is Tim Mulligan. I'm the Chief Human Resources Officer for San Diego Zoo Global. We have two zoos, the San Diego Zoo, and then we have the San Diego Zoo Safari Park. And then we have our research uh, division. It's called the San Diego Zoo Institute for Conservation Research, and we have about 100 scientists or so, and we also have uh, employees around the globe working on uh, saving endangered species in projects. So I'm 
what I like most about my job is uh, I, I, every day I pinch myself as I walk through the beautiful Balboa Park in San Diego Zoo and what great surroundings I have and how lucky I am to be surrounded by all that beauty in nature. And, um, but as for the job itself, um, like I said last night, I love HR. I, you know, it's, to me, my stress falls away when I get to work. It, it rises when I get home. But when I get back, when I get to work every day, I get, you know, I, I work for an organization that allows me to, in fact, uh, uh, relies on me to let my innovation, you know, flag run wild. And so I get to be, uh, be innovative, be creative, be strategic, and, um, and I'm looked upon as someone to do that. So I, it, it's every day I'm challenged, and I love bringing new ideas to the workplace that could change the lives of many. So. Great. So hearing your words, what stuck out to me was potential, new challenges, effective, lasting impact, people, innovation. So let's talk about how CHROs, the responsibilities have changed and expanded. And I'd love to start with Candace. Recently, you have a, a larger role as CAO. So how, what, how did this come about? How has things changed for you? And how can you talk to our audience about these different responsibilities that HR carries? The journey for me at the National Aquarium, since I didn't put in the plug for my organization, uh, the National Aquarium uh, is more than the brick and mortar facility located in wonderful Baltimore. Uh, we are also players in the conservation space and employ a number of scientists that are really working on how human humanity connects with the world's oceans our water, our life source. The journey for me at the National Aquarium started in a traditional HR role. I described it for uh, many people that asked me, why in my career am I going from an 11,000 employee company to an organization that had 600 employees? Now in the HR space, you know, we define, you know, our level of role by the number of employees. I had made a shift in my journey where the definition of my success became more about the impact I was making in the world and less about the number of people the organization had. And it was the aha moment where I woke up and said, all right, what am I doing? What contribution am I making? My journey at the aquarium started with any organization, as you know, they often ask you as HR professionals, I want the red car. You know, I want talent management strategies. I want all of the buzzwords that I'm hearing. And I quickly realized that that shiny red car did not include an engine, <laughs> and they had no money for an engine. <laughs> How familiar does that sound for folks? <laughs> uh, so what I was able to do at the National Aquarium uh, is quickly uh, implement talent management strategies and best practices commonly found in large for-profit organizations. So my humor, for those of you that know me personally or you'll get to know me, I describe it as I went around turning on light switches. And I was like, look, if you turn on the switch, there's light. <laughs> you don't need flashlights, truly. Uh, so what happened uh, over time is the impact that HR was making in the organization truly translated to the financial sustainability of the organization. So my impact resulted in a financially sustainable organization where we had greater control on what I describe as the investment in people, and we were looking at the investment as a investment that reaped a return. When the opportunity became available for me in my life to look to do something different, the understanding of the business, the impact made to what I describe as the key performance indicators, I was no longer seen on the executive team as the HR professional. 
I was seen as the business professional. And the last piece of this journey for me, I now sit here today, um, and this, is, this has been new for me. I'm in this role now for eight months, and now my career goals are no longer the top HR person in an organization. My goal is to be a CEO of an organization. The expertise you gain being an HR professional and developing teams and developing people are critical to the success of any organization and any organization's bottom line. That's my story, that's my journey. Would anyone else like to chime in? <laughs> <laughs> About responsibilities, how your role has changed? I can add to that. I um, uh, was hired as the HR person. I'm responsible for the entire human resources function, about 3,200 or so employees. And, um, and I remember a couple years ago, I was at, uh, I was at a, an a CHRO conference like this, and I was talking to someone from Corn Ferry, and this is nothing against Corn Ferry. I love Corn Ferry if you're here. Um, so, but I asked someone, and you know, on, the, on a break, you know, I'm a CHRO, uh, at a nonprofit, a zoo, and I feel like I've you know, been there about 10 years, I'm kind of known as the zoo guy, and how do I break past that? How do I, you know, what advice do you have for me if I want to become a COO, CEO, or uh, go, you know, leave the company and do HR for a, a you know, mega corporation or something? And, and she thought, and she gave me this advice, which I'm sure was great advice, which was, I think you should leave. <laughs> your job and start a business or you need to manage a, you need to lead another company that you start. And I walked away thinking, I, I'm not gonna do that, what? So, um, <laughs> so but, but it got me thinking about, okay, I'm not gonna leave my job, I understand what she's saying, but you know, what can I do in my own organization? So I put it out there to my CEO, who I report to, that you know, HR is in a good spot, I'm ready to do more. And so, so my boss a couple years ago took that to heart, and this is our centennial year, it's our 100 year anniversary, so he put me three years ago in charge of our entire centennial. So that's all I've been doing for the past three years practically. I don't, I don't, I don't do day-to-day -day HR stuff anymore. I'm accountable for the HR team, but I'm working on uh, remodeling projects and marketing projects and giant capital campaigns of fundraising and you know, I had a $9 million, or so $9 million budget for the centennial that I had to have everybody, you know, working around. So the point is, is that I, that's a project that's, it's, it was, it's gone great. It's, it's elevated my stature, I think, and not just being known as an HR guy, but someone who can manage a multi-million dollar budget. He can manage construction and renovations and the, 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 the marketing side and the fundraising side and the animal side. So uh, and what it's done for me is it's just got me thinking about, you know, I could do this, I could easily step out of my role, I think, and, and do anything. So that's what I'm doing right now. I mean, you know, I'm, I've, I've put it out there that I am ready to move on. Uh, I love HR, but, but I would like to be, like Candace said, a C, the CEO or the COO. And that's what I'm moving towards now. That's my succession plan. And so I'm preparing myself for when that happens. It won't be a surprise. I'm like, you know, people are going to say, how's the HR guy going to do this? Because yeah, I think you have to prove yourself that you're not just the HR person, but you can also be the business person, the strategic person, the leader. Uh, and I, but I think the one thing I really had to ask myself in making that decision was, do I want that? Because HRs are really fun, you know? <laughs> and I, and I said, I've got a great gig in HR. I love HR, I've worked for it for years. Uh, but I think once you make that decision, then you have to really position yourself as uh, someone who can easily make that transition out of HR into a uh, C-suite type role. But I think you have to kind of fight for it and prove, your, prove yourself. So how do you get out of that comfort zone? Well, I said how I did it. I mean, I, I've been taking on more and more projects. Uh, I'm trying to show that HR can be a revenue generating department. That's one thing I've done. I, you know, I have a book coming out next week. All the money goes to the zoo. I've created training programs now that other zoos subscribe to, and the money goes to the organization. So I think that's how I've done it. I've kind of set myself up and also showed that HR can also be a, a revenue generating department if you do it right. So. And I, I'm sorry, I know I've spoken already, but I'm having a reaction Everyone. to what I'm hearing. Because uh -oh. we, no, <laughs> we spend our careers as HR professionals talking about you know, how we show up, how we break out of our boundaries, getting a seat at the table. And I'm gonna challenge everyone in this room. We have all worked in support of CEOs, and you think about the one that, ones that don't understand people as part of their natural strength and style. The cascading impact to the organization 
is so significant. So I believe what we bring as HR professionals as natural strengths and competencies are what's needed in the C-suite. So I couldn't agree more with that. I think HR professionals do bring a lot to the table. Although to your point, Tim, you ask yourself, well, do I want that? So that's what I would challenge us all to think about as well, is just because that seems like a natural progression to get ahead, you know, I, I would challenge all of us to think deeply about who we are, what we believe, where our strengths are, what gives us energy, what are we passionate about, what, are, what do we want our legacy to be? And based on that increased self-awareness, what types of opportunities align with those personal values, those personal priorities? Too often we take the linear path versus asking ourselves those tougher questions. Uh, and if we live in alignment with those things that are so personal to us, ultimately we'll be successful. Ultimately we'll show up authentically. Ultimately we'll show up passionately every single day and we'll be successful. So, for some, and it sounds like you're passionate, you're finding your path, and God bless you. I don't know that that's the path for everyone. For me personally, I've had several opportunities throughout my career to move over into operations, and as flattering as it was every single time, and as hard as I thought about it every single time, I ultimately realized I would be living out of alignment and I wouldn't be playing to my greatest strengths. So, so I, for I, those, I, oh, I'm sorry. sorry. I was going to say, um, related to that, I have throughout my career taken steps out of HR. And um, so, you know, early in my career, I did an operational move and I worked for Bloomingdale's and I moved into store operations for, for a stint. Um, when I worked for GE later and was, I went through the HRLP program at GE, I also went on the audit staff, GE's audit staff, and I spent some time doing that. Um, I went into consulting for a while, and when I was a consultant, um, I was often mistaken for a finance person. Um, and then I worked for private equity for two CHRO roles, but in both of those situations, I was viewed as much more of a business leader than an HR partner, because my head, being part of private equity, had to be all about what was the outcome for that business. And so not thinking that you know, we had an, an endless glide path going forward, but there was a three to five year cycle where there was either going to be a sale to a strategic or an IPO, or something was gonna happen with the business. So if I thought like a traditional HR person, and not to use that in any, any bad way, but um, if I didn't think like a financially oriented business person about what was expected to come out of that business, I would not have been successful and I would have been removed from that role. So um, for me, I've taken a lot of steps outside, but I also agree with you. Where is my love? Where is my passion? I don't aspire to be a, um, a CEO at this point in my career. What I do aspire to be is a business leader who can make impact in a lot of different ways through partnerships. And I sit on our sales and marketing council. I sit on our executive committee. I um, get involved in all sorts of initiatives throughout the organization that really are not, don't have anything in the world to do with HR. But because I'm a business leader and I understand what the business is about and I'm there to further the business. And so I think sometimes it's a matter of mindset. You can be that business leader because to your point, Candace, um, we, we bring something that is a talent that does not always exist in the rest of the C-suite um, consistently. And, um, and in doing so, we bring a very important formula to, to the overall equation. Lori, I'd like to yeah, hear input on this. That? So a lot of common themes here in terms of uh, I identify, you know, with my experience. Um, I have gotten more responsibilities, it seems like, every, every year. We're, we've, you know, every year is a different year. Uh, we have had Accenture uh, advising the company for about nine months now. We've gone through a major reorganization, I believe three or three complete restructures within the span of 18 months, significant restructuring. And uh, each time you go through these things, they are very difficult, but you learn a lot, of course. Um, and so I'm always telling my team, it's all learning. Just take you know, the good and the bad, you're, all, you're gonna learn from it. Um, 
I took responsibility for workers' compensation and payroll at the beginning of the year. And uh, so many interesting things happen. Um, but being a problem solver, you know, to Mark's point, you know, what do, what do I like to do? Where, where, where am I fulfilled? I like to solve problems. And uh, kind of the more complex, you know, the better. And you learn through, my, my career journey has been all HR. Uh, and you learn to see facts and patterns and, and put the story together. Uh, I, I joke with my team about this. One, one day I got a call from the, my president and he said, Lori, you've got to solve this call off problem. This is your number one priority. I said, okay, this has never been on my radar. Uh, okay, boss, it not, there's no more sandboxes. You know, um, in, when you are a good problem solver, uh, the bosses seem to just not be as concerned with boundaries uh, and see you working collaboratively with your colleagues and that's probably most proud of that but also find that the most rewarding part of my job and then I guess to your question then that results in expanded responsibilities um, it does make me very confident increasingly so that if I wanted to be CEO, if and when I want to, uh, I can be. Uh, I absolutely um, have the key attributes of a great CEO, uh, and it's taken me some time to like even say those words. I think all of us, or at least the speakers that I've heard so far, we so undervalue and underestimate our awesomeness. You know, and <laughs> I, it, I would. <laughs> Because um, we do awesome things, and when you tell other people outside of HR about the volume and the, and the things and the, the, the mass and the barriers and how you got things done, they're impressed, and so we should tell our stories more. Um, but yeah, that's... Well, that's interesting storytelling. Um, in the magazine, we're frequently covering branding, employer branding. How about personal brand? How are you positioning yourself <laughs> to be sought after by other leaders or other organizations, perhaps make an or even with your own organization. So I actually have probably a good example of that. Um, I have been with MSC for about 20 months now, so under two years. And the brand of HR in the organization was of fear, the police. If I go to HR, I'm bound to get in trouble. Um, you know, not the place of yes, always the place of no. Um, never helping to solve problems, but instead tell you why you created a problem and, and get you in trouble. And that's, that's what I walked into. So um, I would say I've spent the last 20 months changing the brand of HR. And it starts with me. Um, in the end, I have to behave differently and show my team how to behave differently and reinforce all the right behaviors and change that brand. Um, I happen to be very um, close with our, our head of strategy and marketing and e-commerce and we laughingly say it's all about changing your bumper sticker. You've, all of us have a bumper sticker <laughs> on the back of us. We don't often look at it, sometimes we can't. Other people know what it is. Um, and changing it is hard. It doesn't disappear easily. And it's only through consistency and it's only through um, people really trusting that things are different do they believe that it is different. And so creating a brand where, um, a, a place where you, you feel comfortable coming, where someone's going to help you, where the answer is never no, it's all how about we approach it this way or let, you know, the redirecting and, and solving problems and finding solutions and being positive, not a place of blame or accusation. Um, you know, that takes time and people didn't believe it for a while. But when you're consistent enough and you're driving that consistently, um, you, you change your brand. And so part of it is deciding what do you want that brand to be within the organization. And then very slowly, surely creating that brand and, and changing your bumper sticker. Was it challenging on board with your project? I'm, I'm still doing it. I mean, every single day. Because we are, we're a large dispersed organization, 
Um, and so I can say with a fair amount of confidence that those people who are in our major population centers, they, they know and they see that things are very, very different and the brand is, is changing. But we have people out in the field who maybe interact with HR once every couple of years. And for them, they, they don't necessarily know. Maybe they've heard a little bit, maybe they've seen a little bit, but um, you know, it takes time and consistency and touches and, um, and communication. And it, it isn't easy and it does take time. So what bumper sticker are you working towards? <laughs> <laughs> um, <laughs> you know what? That's a really good question. I don't think I've named it yet. I, I, I've identified what it was, which was not a good thing. Um, I think, I mean, it's, it's horrible to say, but, you know, HR, we're, we're here to help. And I mean right. that on all different levels. If you're a business leader and you've got a business problem, we help you solve that problem. If you're an associate who just can't navigate a benefits claim or something like that, we're there to help. And sort of everything in between. Um, and, and it's sort of cheesy because, you know, consultant, I'm here to help or, or whatever, but, um, but I really think that's more of what I'd like to see than where we are. We're HR, we're the police, and we're out to get you. Absolutely. <laughs> um, anyone else can speak to me? Yeah, I want to jump in on this because this just sparked an idea for me, but what would my bumper sticker say? I have a colleague who calls me uh, the, the secret business development executive. And I think that, that there's an important tie back to the stories that we tell about our success because uh, what HR could not do before, years ago, was often the excuse for lack of growth or lack of success or lack of ability to make the customers happy. Well, HR will never be able to recruit the people we need, so they would only fill those jobs and we could run more effectively. A lot of our success is telling our story over and over again so that those kind of things go away. And uh, now I think with you know, influential people in the company, we're used as really an enabler to say, why don't we go after that? Because I know we can, we can fill those jobs. I know our brand is good in that market. Or I know we can be competitive. We've got the HR team to deliver. Um, and that comes with knowing your market, and uh, already here, most of my connections and my thoughts have been about growth opportunities, similar markets. Um, so, so my bumper sticker would say, BD growth, right? Mm -hmm. <laughs> BD growth. <laughs> yeah. Very good. Anyone else? I will uh, chime in, because uh, taking this all in uh, and thinking for the first time about my bumper sticker, uh, <laughs> My bumper sticker would say, facilitator of solutions. Uh, I believe your brand uh, is really uh, your impact. Uh, the two are, are one and the same, and I agree. Uh, what I've heard so far is, you know, the work you do has got to align with your purpose, right? You know, it's got to be about uh, who you are. And uh, I've had the experience of going out on LinkedIn, right? And you got these people trying to create this brand, you know, using technology. And I can read it and uh, question whether truly that is, you know, who they are uh, and what they do, because what you do is measured truly by the impact that you make. And uh, for me, facilitating solutions is part of what I do in my pay job at the National Aquarium. But most importantly, it is part of what I do in the community uh, because my brand <laughs> can't just be within the organization. It is how I am viewed and how my organization is viewed in the broader community. I would just add uh, to branding, you know, uh, it's a big thing in our department. So. Um, when I, kind of like uh, Carrie said, when I started, uh, I was kind of given a challenge of taking everything that had been done and putting a positive twist on it and making HR being a very respected, very uh, strategic and a place you want to go as opposed to a place you don't want to go. So we, uh, we, we had every single um, program that we've created has a brand to it. We partnered with our marketing team r right away. We have, we have a, a great logo and tagline and look for every program that HR puts out. 
My team knows not to put an email out or anything out if it doesn't look like it was done by a professional ad agency. We brand everything in HR right now. We have a great employment brand, so we have that going for us as well, and I think a real strong employment brand. We all know, the, we all know why that's important. We had each of our leaders in our organization, we have 300 managers, write their own leadership brand, kind of their legacy. You know, how do you want to be described? How do you want to be looked at as a leader? We compiled those and put together a organizational leadership brand that we, look, we use that when we go out and recruit leaders. But then from the personal branding, that's kind of a new thing, newer thing. You know, I think that you could stop at your HR branding and, and, if, and, and be happy with, with that. But if you want to move on, I think, to a CEO level or to do something differently, then you have to then move on to the personal branding. And so, and that's kind of what I'm going through now. You know, you have to be an expert at social media and you have to start blogging and you have to speak at every HR conference that's out there. I, I feel if no, you want- No, just our conference. I, I, okay, just this one. I'm starting <laughs> just this HR. year. Just say sure today. But you know, I think that if I wasn't looking to move up to CEO and I wasn't looking to do anything differently than what I'm doing in HR, I wouldn't be as concerned about the personal branding. But I think that for me, if I want to put myself out there as someone who is, can be looked at as a strategic overall strong leader, the personal branding is important. You know, and that's why I wrote a book and that's why I have a blog now. And that's why I'm you know, in, in speaking and, and volunteering for all these projects and very involved in my community, like Candace said. You know, so I feel it's very important if you wanna take that role from CHRO to the next level. I think it's important for every professional. It just seems like some industries are more akin to like yeah. simple sales. But why shouldn't you tell your experience, sure. your ability in these um, social networks. So obviously everyone on our panel has really gotten to that strategic level of HR. Um, but it would be great if you could just kind of provide some insight on how to get there because there are obviously day-to-day -day activities that need to be executed and when they're not executed well they hold you back. So if anyone can speak to that. Sure, I'll start. First and foremost, we have to have our own house in order, right? No one wants to hear about all these great strategic ideas we have if we're not getting people paid properly or, or we're having compliance issues. So it takes a very thoughtful process to build an HR agenda that builds from the foundation first so that your house is in order. If you don't know where you're going, every road gets you nowhere. So it's good to talk about, okay, what do we want to achieve and what do we want to be and what impact do we want to have? And then we have to clearly identify, well, where are we at today? And sometimes we get <laughs> frozen because that's such a big gap and how do we get all the way from here to there. But instead of what we often do is just you know, random initiatives that aren't connected, we say, I don't have to understand, I know where I'm going, I don't have to understand exactly how to get all the way there. All I have to know are the next few steps, the foundational steps that'll get me closer. And when you get the, through those steps, when you execute with excellence, you'll be able to see a little further. So long as you keep on that path, ultimately, you'll be moving closer to that desired end state. And once your foundation is strong, to get closer to your question, you know, we not only have the opportunity to be more strategic, I would argue uh, we have the opportunity, the unique opportunity in our function to actually guide strategy for the organization. I mean, how many organizations out there, it's so common that you operate in silos, right? And, and the employees say, yeah, I'm working hard, but I don't know to what end, where are we going? Or even the businesses say, yeah, we're doing our piece, but I don't know how it connects. And even for budgeting or, or strategy discussion, even at the executive level, oftentimes you hear, well, you know, I'm not really sure what we're working towards other than, you know, succeeding for this next quarter. And I think, you know, when you have those feelings, you come out of those meetings and everyone says, yeah, we should get clarity around that. But who's going to lead that? Is it the IT guy? You know, oftentimes it falls into finance, but then it becomes a financial exercise, which is certainly part of it, but that's not inspiring, right? I mean, EBITDA growth is not inspiring for the workforce, that employee that wants to know why am I working so hard, or those business leaders that want to, want to align resources and strategy so that we can galvanize our efforts and truly succeed. So I would say that HR professionals at the enterprise level or even at the team level have an opportunity to facilitate this cross-functional, cross-divisional change, right? Anytime you have these complex programs, these complex strategies that have a lot of interdependencies, we're uniquely qualified to come in and not necessarily be the subject matter expert in any of these pieces, but be the facilitation expert of, 
how do we clearly define what we want to achieve and how do we all work together to create a path to that? When that's done, it can be you know, life-changing. I mean, life-changing for employees and, and business units as well as you know, momentum builds momentum and all of a sudden when you get that clarity around what we're trying to achieve and everyone builds their budgets around that and everyone applies resources around that and if anything's not aligned with that, it's ultimately deprioritized. When you get that clarity around prioritization, amazing things can occur. Excellent, thank you. Anyone else? I'll weigh in. I, you know, so I, I am going to take the leap and uh, start with that most of the professionals sitting in this room uh, in the HR space uh, have strategies. <laughs> you're leading uh, to outcomes that are connected to strategic priorities. Uh, what has been my experience uh, is the creation of strategic priorities only produce results when there's a compelling call to action for change. Um, I have spent uh, you know, many, many hours, weeks, months you know, working with leaders to come up with talent management strategies uh, for these strategies to be a guiding force and to set direction for the work we're doing, yet to only find out uh, through a number of ways, whether it's funding for these initiatives or what I describe as the uh, passive resistance. So you're pushing out your programs and you're sitting down with managers and they're doing this and then nothing happens, that in order to shift from you know, tactical to strategies that are about setting new direction and change, there needs to be a compelling call to action for the organization to want change. Uh, when I got to the aquarium, that's where I started, they wanted this red car. We needed to develop the competency of change leadership that was more of a compelling call to action than it was for me to give them all of the glitzy talent management <laughs> strategic priorities because they weren't ready to do anything with it. So the shift has got to be starting with what is the business need, why, and what is the organization committed to do. Great. Well, we have a few minutes left. I'd like to open it up to the audience. I'm sure you have questions. I see one in the back. Um, <clears throat> thank you. Um, uh, last year I had a neat opportunity to sit down with 35 of the Fortune 100 CFOs <clears throat> and it was a closed door session and the, and the discussion was what should they know about HR? And one of the conversations out of this, um, you know, CFOs <clears throat> every quarter are going into the C-suite with their dashboard of metrics directly aligned to the business. And I think one of the sentiment that came out from the CFOs was, HR has to do the same thing. You need, a, to, to Carrie's point, you need kind of business metrics that link HR directly to the business line that you're in. I was wondering if you guys can talk about what kind of dashboards you used um, to kind of guide your businesses, directly linking it to business performance. Uh, I can say we, uh, we are not there, and we should be. And in my organization, we actually have a new strategic plan just for HR. I have two of my members right in front of me. And it just, our next three-year plan is devoted to that, so we have an end result we're trying to create, which is to have my team of 20 HR professionals to become uh, uh, knowledge experts in all areas of our business. So we're creating a, uh, a dashboard that any one of our people can go in and sit down with the manager and be able to talk the business whether it be in restaurants, they can talk margins and per capitas and, and, and then and bring, and bring the HR stuff to the table too, like cost per hire, all the turnover, all the information they need. We don't have it now, but we, I think that in this, to go back to the last question, you know, for, for, for not just myself and my HR team to be looked at at that level, they need to understand the business, I think, more than we've been asked to in the past. And so we're trying to create a team that can walk into any meeting at any part of our industry whether it be legal, architects, marketing, animal experts, scientists, and be able to talk the talk and also bring some things to the table. So I don't have an answer to your question. I just know that's what I, I agree with you, and we're trying to shoot for that, and it's a, it's a work in progress for us right now. 
My experience, because I really had to think about your, your question, uh, because we are in the, the same space. We are in the process of, of building, uh, and it started with collaboration. So uh, over the course of my career, I cracked the joke that I've spent my career uh, trying to convince finance professionals to invest in programs that I know have impact. Uh, so there's been this natural tension uh, I spent my career, you know, with finance counting uh, and reporting on FTEs, and I'm looking at bodies. Every person counts to me. So how do I get to the table to collaborate with finance in a way that we understand the key performance indicator in both of our functional areas? Because they're two puzzle pieces that need to fit. Uh, and at the aquarium, uh, we, are, we have completed our first milestone, uh, which I have described as our first beta test of a dashboard collaboratively uh, created by finance and HR. And I have to start with the emotion first, not the logic. Just getting those folks in the room to agree <laughs> was step one because their language uh, in my world uh, at the aquarium and in the world of not-for-profits, so let me just say this so you think about it, they talk about people as an expense, not an investment. So just to get over that hurdle alone, to figure out how we come up with metrics that are shared and really speak to the performance of the organization was a huge effort because it started with some difference in mind thought. So I also, um, just 20 months in, we, have, we don't have um, the systems, frankly, in place to get real good data out of our system. So we have some real rudimentary things on turnover and, and those types of things. But part of building the brand, sort of to connect this back, and building the credibility of HR means that you speak the terms of business and, and of finance professionals. And so I've led um, a number of big initiatives in the organization since I've started. In every single case, I bring in the finance people and often IT as well, um, because they're critical to the success of, of whatever it is that we're doing. Um, but put everything in terms that they understand, not HR speak, but in terms of finance or or the IT terms of, of what it's going to deliver and produce and the results we're gonna get and focusing on outcomes versus the steps that you're gonna go through and really painting the business case. And in doing so, um, that was part of building my brand. I was someone who came forth and, and didn't just say, oh, this is a nice to have or a nice to do. It was a business imperative and, um, and that's how you can create credibility and respect. Um, now, I have a lot to do in terms of creating that dashboard, and I do believe that there are certain key measures and metrics that really can paint the story for, for what we do and deliver in the organization. But I also feel like there's sometimes you see a bad dashboard so cluttered with different measures and metrics that don't really paint the picture and, and send false positives um, that you're doing your job when, when maybe we're not or we're not doing the things that are gonna make the biggest impact. So I am um, really big on making sure that they're the right measures and that um, you understand that it's directional, that a lot of the data that we have in HR um, can be cluttered with some noise that, that can send false measure, measure, um, messages. And so make sure you understand what you're looking at and, and looking at it clearly and taking it as directional information versus absolute. Okay, we're going to end on that point. If you have a question, maybe you can grab a panelist after. We're going to just try and stay on time. So let's give a big round of applause to our panel. Thank you very much.